Hello everybody and uh, welcome to the 103rd edition of the Frank and Stan chat and uh, really pleased to say Russell Harvey's come back to join us one of our Hello. first guests thanks Russell I know gosh how long ago was that you don't have to answer us anything well, <laughs> well maybe 100 and 100 episodes ago yeah I, I think it was maybe... I think probably about about 80 or so back right. um, okay. yeah um, and I, I remember you were in a you're you're away from the office you were I think had a weekend away in the late absolutely yes I was in um a little tiny converted railway um yeah I remember carriage that. yes absolutely yeah. yes uh, good friends of ours uh yes Nikki and David have got this yeah I was I just remembered now yeah. good yeah and uh how are you Stan uh good it's uh, Friday the 13th I've yeah. just come back from a few days in Wales my wife's got over Covid uh, mm. but we did come back to the electricity being off because of the major um switch had flicked so the freezers have all melted oh. and the alarm systems broke <laughs> apart from um, that everything's great great um russell uh i think people can see from the screen behind you what you're about but do you just want to give us a little brief sort of summary of uh how you came to be the resilience coach yeah so uh thank you so much um the real short version so uh, uh, 1996 in Hong Kong, that was like a, an inkling of there's something that uh, I want to do in my life. And it was being in a room with people that were learning. OK, so at the time, you know, what was going on. I was teaching people English. But when they were like they got something, I went, oh, God, that, that feels great. You know, gave me a little buzz. Uh, and and uh, I just knew for me personally, I didn't want to be a teacher in a school not criticizing anything i just went that's not me <laughs> you know um although i do an awful lot of work around schools um so i've had a career in learning leadership and organizational development and uh, from my time at the co-op group after i joined there things went a little bit difficult <laughs> um, and this whole thing of resilience came up and also another bit i do is the lovely acronym of vuca world we live in volatile uncertain complex and ambiguous and i spent probably now the last 13 years literally going right you know change is constant let's talk about this differently there's vuca skills there's resilience you know skills capabilities and it's like actually if you find a way to sort of develop those you'll get into the place where do you know what even though it can be difficult and challenging i'm all right i'm pretty good you know or even i'm great yeah. You know, and that's the resilience piece that, that I'm at of actually how do we get you to this place where you can absolutely be at your best and feel pretty good, um, even though you may be having to deal with some difficult challenges and things. Yeah. I mean, just to be clear about the co-op, I mean, they were going through their existential crisis, weren't they, when uh, they were they were they, they were virtually, I think, about one afternoon away from going under um, they were, yes. and they were losing a lot of staff and what have you. So it was a very difficult time. We were there together. But you're also a chair of governors, weren't you, for one of the. the primary yeah, it was. Schools? Yeah, for Woodlands, which was brilliant. I just. Um, it was one of those, I don't know what, why, what I'd seen, but there was some philosophy around, you know, say yes to everything. And, and I, I adored my time at the co-op and it really met my um, values. Um, and, and so it put me in that mindset of like, you know what, I'm going to go for anything that comes my way. I remember the lovely Mags Bradbury yeah. walking past me. His in, birthday in, is today. Believe oh, me. happy yeah. birthday, Mags. Yeah. Happy birthday, Mags. And she just walked past us at one stage and just go, uh, so do you want to do, do something? And I'm going... Yes, and it transpired into, uh, yeah, ultimately becoming chair of governors at Woodlands. Yeah, yeah. it's really good. Um, yeah, I think you did five, well, uh, probably how many years? Did you... Six, six. Six years, six. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, well, uh, it's great to have you back. And uh, also we'll talk a little bit because you've got a radio um, programme yeah. as well that you're doing now, a weekly programme. So we'll get onto that after we've done What's Caught Your Eye This Week, Stan? Well, um, several things as usual um all i think related to somewhat to head teacher well-being but but ofsted doing inspections during sats week for me doesn't doesn't fit with well-being of anybody mm. um and changing the laws in order to give the dfe greater powers 
over schools doesn't to me ring with the autonomy that goes with well-being being autonomous is part of, of a positive move towards well-being but it's how we manage head teacher well-being that, that's causing me a concern at the moment mainly because i keep seeing on twitter lots of of head teachers who are saying right that's it i've, I've done my whack now i'm off uh, i can't face another uh, and people saying i can't face another week and I just think head teacher well-being, we've done a lot of work, schools have done a lot of work on well-being for children, well-being for staff, but it's who takes that? I know it's governors. Who takes that responsibility? Is it regularised? Is it something that, that people do because there's a prompt to do it? Or is it when you remember, which is, in my case, it's when I remember to, to, to ask the head how things are going on and how they are themselves. And I just wonder if we'd be better off moving to a, a, an ordered system where maybe either external people are responsible for providing that or a kind of uh, rehashing of the mentor system that a lot of schools, a lot of head teachers got when they first came into headship. You, you got a mentor uh, and that was somebody you worked with. Now, sort of redefining that might be a way, a way around it. I don't know. I, I just think... It's not, it doesn't appear to be organised at the moment. Well, one thing, just before Russell comes in, because I'm sure he's got something to say about this, just I saw some data this week that said that most head teachers, they're in post for four years on average. Hmm. See that? You know, so in a way, I'm, that's not suggesting that they survive four years as a head and then they're sacked, but they move on to a different role. And, and there was some research, I think there's been some substantial research over a period of time suggesting that you, know, you become less effective after your seventh or eighth year, but you need that time to become effective. So at four years, it feels as though that's probably too soon to be moving off, you know, moving out. So, mm -hmm. you know, if people see their time at a school in, in that sense, that short length of time, that really is very little time to embed change, you know, so in effect, we're all we're in this VUCA situation all the time. Then Russell, aren't we? And you know, if, if 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 senior leaders are going at that rate of knots, we will certainly run out of senior leaders or people wanting to do it. No, um, there's loads I could jump in here with, and, and just on that of like the keeping going. That's what um, I've noticed. Still, many people get confused around this lovely definition of of what's resilience. So it's even uh, so do some work within the NHS as well. And uh, and what the people that, that commissioned me to do it went to um, some of the nurses and said, oh, we're going to get this resilience person in. And the response was, oh, for goodness sake, you know, uh, 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 this week, today, I've literally done this, 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 and this, and this, and this. I'm here. I've survived. I've been resilient. So no, you know, and I'm sort of got that second hand and went, oh, never more is somebody in need of understanding that that isn't being resilient you know with lots of love and compassion it's going you're potentially just on the verge of not coping you know and what resilient people are is that they're in this lovely other place i know it's ethereal of like thrive it, but it's and it takes a it takes effort and energy in a while to get there but actually you're feeling a lot different about the challenges you face so keeping going is not resilience you know and piling other things on and and back to the yeah the teach well-being in terms of trying to how you make it work and how you sort of make it managed and ordered it's you know factually it, logically it'd be a case of so um chair of governors to head teacher you know um uh, put uh in a way that feels energizing and enjoyable sort of formalizing the conversation around uh, how are you from governor to head teacher you know and actually, what are we doing to support you? You know, and, and, and in the educational sphere of like support and challenge can get a little bit mixed up. So I do nicely. I have a few head teachers that are clients. And then when um, you, know, you do a contracting conversation with a new client, you, get, you sort of go, so how are we going to work together? And how would you like me to support you? And how would you like me to challenge you? And I have noticed that actually when we say the word challenge, the, the head teacher just... <laughs> just because yeah. uh, in their mind challenge is uh, Ofsted or on occasion too many questions from governors that yeah. don't feel you know as though they are uh, helping 
when they're yeah. challenging, you know? So I think that's a huge part of it. And so, you know, I spend a little time to go. So the style with an independent person is we're, we're looking at you as a human, but it's also about the whole leadership piece. So I would segue from, from the well-being into sort of the leadership piece to go, actually, how can you be at your best? And that actually requires that actually I've got to feel pretty good. Well, you've as a confident, I was trying to use the word confidence. Mm -hmm. I have to say in leadership, I've there have been occasions when I've felt very confident about and and, and although there's been loads of things going on, always and, and, and struggling to get them all done. But I felt as though on the big ticket issues that I knew what I was doing and I felt as though I had people with me. You know, and that's brilliant because that but, that's a perfect example. Sorry, Frank. Of, no. Or ask the question of like for, to leaders, do you feel in command of your environment? So not control, but do you feel in command? And command is a feeling. So if people listen to this, I'm really sorry, I don't have any specific technical nail down of what does command look like. It's like exactly what you've just said, Fred. Or actually, do you know what? There's a lot going on, but I actually feel as though I've, I can sort of wrap my arms around it and actually things are going in the general direction I need because if you try and control everything you'll get yourself into a pickle mm. but if you're in command you will actually uh, you will have areas of control where you need to Stan, you've been so wasp <laughs> <laughs> that's all i need really, I, I could stop the recording now but i'm not going to um, okay watch me get stung by a wasp and the thing is also russell is that i think i found myself um, my well-being um, was supported um, by, I think, by the position I took. I, th I, I got to this quite late in my career about this idea that you just got to appoint people that are better than you. You know, that's the skill of it. You know, and actually, I felt as though I was supported by some pretty amazing yeah. senior leaders. You know, including you know the the chair of the trust board. Um, yeah. So there was never a point where I felt. Profession, I felt professionally challenged, but I never felt professionally insecure, you know. Oh. So, and and I think that there are a lot of heads who feel insecure and don't fit, don't have not reached that level, or or, or not able to get to a position of feeling confident about it. But and in a way that for me that came with experience and a knowledge about my place in the whole jigsaw, you know that. I was really vulnerable if my team or the, not my team, our team around us was not also sort of trying to connect together and to support each other, you know? So I, I found myself in a better position um, as a, as a CEO because, you know, through, well, I don't think it was luck, but I just, there were some people, pretty amazing people that were making me look a lot better than I really was, you know? <laughs> oh, what a huge well, part of that. Um, it's just the way you started, you know, it's, it's supporting an individual to click, actually, do you know what? I know my strength, skills and capabilities, and actually I haven't got everything. So I, same thing has probably been said for years. People have heard hundreds of thousands of times to go, right, so I need to sort of recruit and appoint some people around me that are going to actually um, fill in my gaps, yes. you know, or better me on this. And two things you said there are specifically two official dimensions of building resilience. So the lovely word of confidence and a support network. You know, so it is just um, finding a way to help people to get into that place of, you know, what does confidence look like, sound like and feel like to me? Um, and, you know, and, and everybody gets there in their own way. Yeah. Stan, you're going to say? I, I was just going to say that. So oh, I've managed my career by by surrounding myself with people who, one, filled the gaps and secondly, were better than me. <laughs> <laughs> because that's, that's how you survive. Yeah. But I, I do think there were times... You know, when even with a fantastic team, I was ahead, a fantastic team around me, a very supportive team, you know, at times like having an Ofsted, you, 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 it doesn't take much to, to, to undermine that confidence. Here's somebody coming into my school who doesn't know our school, doesn't know our team, and yet through a whim or through a slight error or something, my, my career can be shot at. Yeah. And, and more to the point, the school can be damaged. I think, you know, I know a lot of head teachers talk about, about the personal damage, but there's also that emotional attachment to your school that means if the school is damaged in some reputational way, that, that hit, hurts personally. Yeah. Uh, I just think 
you know, we, we did mentoring. I mean, when I was in Lancashire, we had a fantastic mentoring scheme where every new head was appointed a mentor for the first year. And the mentors were all experienced heads who did it voluntarily. They gave up the time because they believed that was worth doing. It was something that people did. And then the National College introduced it with payments. And that somehow managed to devalue it yeah. by, by saying to someone, you have to claim for your day being a mentor. It, it, it lowered its value yeah. in a way. It yeah. became a paid thing rather than something. But, but at the end of the day, Russell, and Stan, there must be people who are just either they've, they've gained the skills like you have, Russell, you know, to do this job professionally, or they've innately good at doing this. Yeah. But actually, I think my experience of, of mentors was that, you know, it, it, it was in a sense, a task given to people or they chose to do it like in your stand, but actually there was just a lack of understanding about the, the complexity of mentoring somebody who's under a lot of stress and strain, you know what I mean? As if to yeah. say, well, I mean, as if to say, well, well, you've been ahead, you know, you've been ahead eight years, you know, you must've seen it all. You know, well, I've I've seen I, I've I've seen one version of reality. That's my version of reality, and trying to help somebody whose whose version of reality is completely different. Their their yeah. family situation is different. Their experience is different. Their expertise is different. Their you know the 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 psychological makeup of them is different. I mean, th this is a really complex uh, and challenging area of work, isn't it? You know, um, but what, I, and I know that there's a lot of push now for you know, for uh, schools to be in groups, in maths, in, you know, and there's a sense there that, that that brings a possibility of leaders being able to to at least converse with each other and support each other. But I'm not convinced no. it, it's the right way because I still think, as I've done this morning to, to, you know, a quick check to see, I've not asked the head where I'm a governor how they're going on and I've just done it now and I know the response will be, I'm absolutely fine. And yeah. I won't I won't go any further than that. And and that's not really very good. It's not very useful. It satisfies me probably yeah, more than more it than satisfies <laughs> the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the head. <clears throat> it's, it's really interesting around uh, you know, trying to do an approach of supporting leaders. It is really about what they need because um I think actually whether it's mentor or a coach, and the only reason I'm distinguishing it is that um if it's a if it's a coach really simplistically then not have an educational background and it's when that's helpful yeah, you know, yeah I agree. And, and so mentor great just occasionally the uh, you need with either a mentor or a coach conversation to enable the individual to get a different perspective which is exactly what you were saying uh, frank i think that that's the thing it's like they need to be able to okay there's a different way in which i could approach what i'm doing and actually I've either given myself permission or I feel confident or I am motivated enough, even though it scares me to give it a go. You know, some version of that is if you can support that individual to get get to that, um, that. I think that's probably the most helpful because people are overwhelmed and down and going, I've no idea what to do. You can give people as many different ideas, but they just maybe think themselves, well, that's not possible. So it's like, how do you support them to get to that place around? Do you know what? there's a different way in which I could be doing something and I'm willing to give it a go. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I think I found it helpful. I think I said before we started recording that my wife isn't a teacher mm. and, and I found her a very good sounding board primarily because she often gave me a different perspective uh, on, well, why did you do that? You know, why didn't you do this or, or had I thought about, which is more often, you know how the person that I was referring to, how they were responding, how they were feeling. You know, and actually, I'd sort of perhaps put the barriers up, and and I thought, well, I, my approach is right, and I, I hadn't actually leant over to see what the world was like from their point of view. You know, um, I'll tell you a, a funny story, Frank, about that. I had um, that I used to be the advisor to had a, a run in with a parent, a particularly nasty one. And he said he went home and, and poured all this out to his wife. And he said at the end of it, she said, well, I can see their point of view. <laughs> and he said, that's not your job. If I am stabbing somebody, your job is to be behind me stabbing them too. <laughs> but actually, that's really important within a senior leadership team, isn't it, as well? That, you know, that people feel confident enough 
to say the thing, you know, and, and actually say, I think you've, you know, how, how many middle leaders are going up to the head teacher or the or even a head teacher within a trust and saying, you know what, I think you got that wrong. Yeah. You know, I, it's just that confidence it, uh, that people feel confident enough to say it. But actually, the senior leader, the most senior leader feeling confident to accept it, you know, and that that's part of actually making a better decision, you know, getting into that sort of nice place where it's not a threat it's not you're not saying i'm rubbish but actually i you know you're just helping me thanks for that you know you well, might ignore it but at least you're able to listen to it that effectively is what google when they did their massive uh, review of what makes a successful team that was the outcome everything else was secondary to what became known as psychological safety yeah but before that they would they were saying it was about taking turns making sure everyone around the table in a meeting had something to say and the opportunity to say it yeah but then you know it developed into psychological safety and i think there's a lot of schools that don't have enough the psychological safety isn't strong enough for no. people to do what you've suggested frank no no this, this is a big part of it i've got um hopefully it's a positively challenged so any governors that are listening to this in yeah. terms of trying to think about how how we might um just make a little bit of a difference or there are some governors that go away to go i'm going to do something different so it's, it's a question for people listening if you're a governor around so do you really genuinely care about your leadership team that's that's the question for governors you know and most and we'll see what people are doing, you know, as they're listening to this now, they'll be like, some have gone off, some are passionate and go, yes, absolutely. So then it's a case of like, so, um, you know, uh, how do you know that's happening? Would be the next question, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's just that, that then hopefully would sort of drive uh, actually a conversation with the, you know, you know, the, the um, all of the governors to go, how we're we doing it, how we're we demonstrating it, what's it look like, how will we know? When is it going to get measured? So they'll be used to all of those types of things. To go, <laughs> actually, we care about them. Um, so that then actually, then they they um, leadership team will feel supported. Um, you know that that will that will make a big difference. And I just suspect there'll be an awful lot of people listening to this who are governors and going, "Well, yeah, that's not my role. My role is to just sort of ask gnarly, difficult, horrible questions." <laughs> hmm. Um, so I'm curious to everybody listen. Well, I'm starting yeah. to feel guilt. I am. We used to say on the critical now, friend Russell. bit, you know, as a governor, you're a critical friend, but you have to be a friend, friend. before yes. you can be a critical yes. friend. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you have yeah. to build the friendship first. That's, yeah, I agree with that. Not just be a critic. Yeah. So it's not it's about good. being a real soft stuff is just go okay if you want to get to the place that you want to get to, one of the things that you need to do is you sort of need to go. Actually, do I do I care? about yeah. this person yeah yeah okay well uh that was a good one stan well done gosh <laughs> um looking at the time um uh, with or was it 23 minutes in already uh russell what's caught your eye this week um so you know the big standard headline of like um ninety thousand civil servants um losing their jobs uh, just you know just the bizarre this is what will come out today to make us all look at something. Um, but it's also, I think, probably um, uh, the wrong thing to be looking at right now. Not uh, I care about civil servants. I'm not dismissing them. You know, all, all of those that are listening to headline and going, oh, Russell, oh, thanks. I, I don't mean that. <laughs> what I do mean is that that is um, a political smokescreen to send us off down a rabbit hole. And I'm just wondering, the other thing that caught my eye, because I was just listening about it uh, when I was on a drive this week. So there's the podcast of Deborah James on the, the Big C podcast. I just think she needs a mention because yeah. I was listening to all about her on the way down in the car this week. Uh, and I don't know why. I hadn't, I hadn't realised that her podcast had existed, but then I was listening to the you know three women that were on it and it just what had happened to them. It was like, okay, there's just reminder, Russell, that there are other things that are going on in the world that you need to just go, let's just pause for a second and let's acknowledge something different that's going on. Yeah, and, and she was, uh, just for the record, she was uh, awarded, is it a Dame Hood? Yes. Yesterday, which is, I mean, in a way, I hope it goes some way to, you know, sort of recognising what she's done, but also has some effect for the family, you know, as they deal with the consequences of all of this in the next few weeks and months. Um, 
for me, uh, I'm not sure now because I'm. I think because we've spoken quite a lot about leadership, I was going to talk about um, different phases of Matt leaders as some research come out this week. But I'm, I'm sort of tempted to move away because we've actually sort of spoken quite a lot about that. Um, I suppose uh, let me just bring it back then to last week we had um, uh, my brother was on Russell and ah. uh, he he spoke about a um, an academic had been asked to produce a book list uh, of uh, great books that had been written during the Queen's reign drawn from across the Commonwealth. Oh, and wow. uh, obviously these lists then become quite problematic, don't they? Um, because they don't include certain authors and whatever. And there was quite, there was a little bit of negative press from, um, from the usual sources about, well, this can't be a good list primarily because I haven't read half the books or all the books. But actually, I think what he he nicely said was that Barry said that, well, we need to produce our own children's list, you know, because this was for adult authors. So there was no J.K. Rowling. There was no Roald, Roald Dahl on the list. So it, it, in, in the meantime, this week, he has been trying to produce a uh, extensive list of 70 books from to cover the Queen's um, uh, reign and actually. One, we're trying to push this out. So I've sent it to Stan's uh, daughter or to Stan. He's going to send it to his daughter. who was a, ch a children's librarian, I think. And and we sent it to Jenny Webb I don't, uh, from Co-op Academy Leeds, who's oh, now yeah, somewhere yeah. else, the funky pedagogy to see what she thinks. But but the, the bigger point was that um, we we were influenced so much by the books that are presented to us. You know, so so Barry had great difficulty. You know, he, he could easily uh, call on uh, British authors, American, well, not American, but some Australian authors, and actually, you know, from from you know uh, from the sort of from the homeland is probably one way of describing it. So there were just a lack of, you know, sort of Caribbean authors that he had actually read, you know, mm -hmm. the the lack of African authors that he had read, you know, and actually, then you re start looking back on it and think, well, actually, of course, I'm a a product of the actions taken by our teachers and their head teachers and what was put in front of me. And, and it made me really sort of reflect on, you know, this sort of narrowness of sort of thinking that we have, we get ourselves in this sort of bubble and, and then there is this other world, but we choose not to venture into it either consciously or, or, or somebody has to open that door for us, don't they? Yeah. And some of that stuff will be just so random, you know, but somebody has to open that door for us. Just a very uh, little sidebar. So um, thinking about I go, I grew up around the corner from Roald Dahl. Oh, really? Uh, yes. Uh, and uh, so where was that, Russell? So that was in uh, um, Great Missenden. That's what I have no was. idea where that is. Where's Great? No, I was going to say that doesn't help either. I was. Yeah. It's in Buckinghamshire. You oh, know? Right. So Gypsy Cottage was literally around the corner uh, from uh, where we were. Um, and uh, I did meet him once, but I didn't know who it was because I was about six or seven. And what we had was this like in primary school, and you know, everybody's in assembly, and random old bloke came and read as a story <laughs> you know and it was like years later when i clicked ah that was real doll because he read his matilda you know oh wow uh, i mean at the time they would have said this is real doll and it's like there's a bit of excitement around this uh, and my wife's an english teacher and she adores real doll and so it's like every time that occasion comes out there's just a look of thunder in her face <laughs> but i can't believe i can't believe you i can't believe you <laughs> Um, I mean, one of the things that uh, you've been doing since we last met is you've started, well, you have a little radio um, program. I do, yes. Oh, yes, no. so a little, yeah, it's it's amazing. So it's it's got a funny name, but it's, it's the reason it's called Yawa Radio, which is a place in Australia, but it also stands for Your Only Wellbeing and Happiness Radio Station. You know, there is another different sort of um, way that name came about, but it's called Yawa. So, it's, yeah, it's, it's a Tinternet station. So it's on, you know, 24-7. And there's a chap called Steve Twynham uh, that started it. Um, and um, I met him at a networking thing and we had a chat and said, I'll do this. And then I just started to record res resilience tips. 
you know, which was literally just, hello, this is Russell, tip for this week is this, and they would play out uh, at different times on the radio station, and that has segued, as I've, you know, kept doing it, to go, actually, uh, I think you need your own show, Russell, you know, so uh, Saturday How did you react to that, though? I mean... Well, uh, yes, it was like, um, uh, you know, one of the many things I adore about life is that you don't know where things are going to take you. It, and, you know, so it's probably still something to do with that, like saying yes to things. I'm not as overt as that uh, uh, as I was, but it's like, this feels good. This feels right. Let's let's try it. Let's do it. Um, and so, yeah, it's uh, Saturday afternoons, but it also gets repeated uh, throughout the week. Um, and so, yeah, it's uh, three to six Saturdays. And it's like without it being an ego boost, we'll laugh about this. We've got Russell's Resilience Radio Show. <laughs> you know, you get all the get all the R's in there. And it is just a load of songs and me chipping in uh, throughout those few hours going, right, here's some things about resilience I've been thinking about. This is what I've been doing. I talked to this person this week and this came up. So you just need to listen in. And the whole of the radio station is about um, just, you know, something that's sort of enjoyable, energizing, inspiring, motivating. You know, there's lots of different um, presenters on there. And it's just like, actually, tune into something. And you know what, it makes me feel good. You right. know, that, that's, that's the idea uh, behind it. It's funny, I think it's, it's driven, I, d I don't know whether we reach that sort of nirvana on the Frankenstein chat as often as you do, Russell. Um, <laughs> But actually, because I think some of the stuff we cover, um, you know, some of it isn't always very good. You know, not the stuff we talk about. It's the stuff we're asked to talk about or, or that have been in the, in the news. Yeah, yeah. But I'm conscious of the fact that, you know, people sort of listen into this and you get to a point where you feel you have to reflect on, because we just did as a, a chat, Stan and I, but you have yeah. to reflect on, well, what are we saying? You know, it, it, at the time, it, it didn't really matter, you know, about whether I said something to Stan, he said something to me, this is what you say amongst friends, isn't it? But but as you share your conversation with others, it takes on a slightly greater responsibility, you know, which I never I never thought about, Stan, when we started this. You know? No, you don't know where things, you really don't I know. I think I did in the first two episodes, Frank, where I was virtually silent. <laughs> <laughs> But as a as an um, outside observer watching and listening to Frank and Stan, what makes you good is actually that um, nice bit of reflective practice there, Frank. I, I've noticed you say a fair few times around. I'm wondering if everybody cares about this or whether this is half good. Mm. Oh, look, we've got to episode 80 or oh, 103. Who thought we'd have got there? So, you know, <laughs> as you know, the fact that you're sort of going, is this is this any good? Uh, will actually make it good. So you know uh, well, there's probably something in that for leaders as well though isn't there there is yeah yeah just yeah. And, and actually that doesn't require a you know it doesn't require much effort to to put that somewhere in your day no um, it definitely doesn't definitely doesn't yeah russell at the end of uh at the end of our 101st edition we we had uh two eminent researchers on um James and Andy, and uh, I think it was James said, "Well, it's it's one hundred and one. We, we, you know, what we're going to put in uh, edition one hundred and one. So we now have a slot called the room one hundred and one, and we ask our guests to tell us what do you want to put in room one hundred and one. Stan and I don't have a choice, um, but you do. So what are you going to put in room one hundred and one? Oh, I thought about this. I was, um, I've got lots of different uh, ones. So where, where shall I go? Um... So I suppose this is this is a proper like, you know, there's not things that many things that rile me. So occasionally go cycling on the Leeds Liverpool Canal and I absolutely um, uh, totally believe in actually allowing the general public to access all of these different things. And so there are other humans that are on there and there are other humans that are also dog owners. OK, so I'm a cat owner. It's not like an argument about which animal is best. And you just what you do when you're riding along is you ding your bell if you've got somebody up in front of you and certain dog owners literally either just wave a hand or immediately grab their dog and just move to one side or just get away or to just like it's noticed. Yeah. There are others that I would like to put into 101, please. Or in the canal. <laughs> well, I, I have wondered if I, if I, <laughs> if I just, if an elbow went out <laughs> now, would that be okay? And it's like you ding the bell and there's nothing. 
you know, or they're actually looking at you. So it's face to face and you sort of you see it coming and the dog's off a lead and it's not doing a lot. And they're not they're not making any noise. They're just looking at me coming towards them. So I'm just doing the bell a few more times and then a, a wave. And I absolutely guarantee at the last second, there'll be a random woolly wave towards the dog, which means it walks in front of oh. my bike. <laughs> <laughs> you know and a lot of the time they just look at me and i'm going well what did you want me to do <laughs> you know so if those particular dog owners could just you know go into room 101 that would be wonderful i'm sure we could arrange for that so uh, russell can i thank you very much for joining us today uh, of course it's been you a can. pleasure Thanks. and uh, again if if colleagues are interested in uh, reaching out to russell his obviously is is all his links are, are there and He's on, on on Tinternet on a Saturday afternoon, and uh, there's also you've put you've just completed a podcast. Yeah, podcast. thank you. So like, if you go on my homepage, just on there you can access. So I've just done a series one, ten episodes. They're not long, maximum half an hour, uh, which is literally episode one is what is resilience. And I have a thing called a resilience wheel, which is a built upon uh, research. And there's eight, sorry, seven aspects to that. So episodes two to eight you know the little chat around each of those aspects of the wheel episode nine is there are five resilience strengths and episode 10 is just a general about resilience and change so if people are wanting to know a little bit more around you know my view of what resilience is or isn't you know there's 10 episodes there you can just go and have a little play around with um so one's on confidence one's on support one's on purpose one's on the lovely word of adaptability mm. you know um so yeah just go through to have a listen and see what you think fabulous Okay, Stan. A, a, a finishing thought, which goes back to mentors, because I know I'll suffer if I don't say this. Uh, I mentored somebody who turned out to, I learned a lot more from them than yeah. they ever learned from me. Uh, and, and also they became a much better head than I ever was. Uh, but if I don't mention that, I know that this person listens and I'll get into trouble. Well, well and I, I also um, mentor, I, I was asked by the DFE to mentor somebody and uh, that I, I was talking to that colleague. Actually, I had my mid-year review um, for some work that I do um and it's it's just a chat and uh, this colleague who i was mentoring is part of that panel and it was really quite joyful seeing the confidence of this 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 man and uh yeah really sort of putting me in my place and you know whatever and making clear that perhaps my understanding of something wasn't quite right you know but but actually that i, I felt really uh positive that i was able to sort of you know in a way i think play a part in helping him develop in that way Anyway, so it's great to have you. Uh, thank thank you, you, everybody, for watching or listening. And uh, we're back next week. Um, we've got a slightly different arrangements. So I think the, pod, uh, the, the the broadcast will go out on the Friday, but uh, it won't be recorded on a Friday. But uh, um, we've got uh, a, a, another another guest coming back. So, Stan, you are going to say? I was just going to say, because Friday is a, a conference for the, those Athena schools. So that's, that's right. why we won't be there. And yeah, so uh, all three of us will be there. We'll be there, yeah. So yeah, lucky schools, I hope. Anyway, okay. So we'll uh, see you all next week, all being well. Thank you.